Hi guys, and welcome back to another Tech Minds video. Now, just over a year ago, I made a video on a remote antenna tuner called the ATU50, which is rated at about 100 watts. In this video, we'll take a look at a very similar antenna tuner, but this time it's rated up to 350 watts. Apparently, it can cover from 3.5 megahertz right up to 54 megahertz. That's 80 meters up to the six meter handbands. Now, at the time of making this video, the ATU350 costs less than £100, but is it worth it? Now, I'll go through the build process and then show you how I install it before doing some testing on air. Now, the blue box that houses the tuner PCB is actually taller than the ATU50 version, and, well, that will become apparent why in a moment. Inside, we find a cardboard box and some plastic parts. These plastic parts are actually mounting plates which we'll install right at the end. The little white rubber strip is actually used to waterproof the top lid against the lower part of the blue box. In the cardboard box, there is a main PCB and a bag of components like wires, plugs and cables. Now we won't actually use all of these parts, but I will show you which parts I use for the build. The reason for the taller box for this ATU should be quite apparent after seeing this main board. But if you didn't get it, well, that's because of these toroids, the four red large circular things. They're much larger in this 350 version compared to the 50 version. And that's all down to it being able to handle more power or up to 350 watts. Now, I would always advise to give the PCB a proper inspection before starting to mount it in the box or starting to add wires, just to make sure all of the components are mounted correctly and all of the visible solder joints look good. In fact, while I was going over the bottom of the PCB, I did notice that some of the solder joints, specifically on the through hole joints, needed some attention. I just used my 450 watt Weller soldering iron to go over each of the suspect solder joints and apply a little bit more solder, just to help it flow and mold around those component leads that go through the board. Now the main box does not have pre-drilled holes to mount the PCB. But before we make those, let's look at the little bag of components that we get supplied with this kit. Now we get various items like wires, copper wires, an LCD screen, a switch, power socket, and a few other items like standoffs and bolts. Now I won't be using the LCD in the final build, but for testing in the shack and making sure the ATU is in full automatic mode, I do solder on four wires to the included LCD. Now the other end of the four wires from the LCD need to be attached to the main PCB like this. Now those wires consist of a ground, VCC, SDA and SCL. Once the LCD is attached, I now need to apply some power. So I solder on a short piece of power cable that I supplied myself. The 12 volt and ground connections on the main PCB are printed so it's easy to see where these wires need to be attached. Now once all the power wires are soldered on and the screen is attached, I just applied 12 volt DC and well, bingo, it powers up. Now the LCD does show various bits of information like power, SWR, and the currently set inductance and capacitance values. The three buttons on the front edge of the PCB are for resetting, bypass, and enabling auto mode. Now we want to make sure the ATU is in auto mode. Luckily, the tuner will remain in auto mode even after disconnecting the power and then reapplying the power. This means we do not need any external switches on the main box. Now that's just one less hole to make and one less area water can get in. When it comes to mounting the PCB into the blue box, you'll notice that the included brass standoffs are actually not long enough. And that's because the toroids actually go through the PCB and stick out underneath. So I had to order a pack of standoffs from Amazon. I think these are around 15 millimeters in length just to give enough clearance. Now you actually need five of them, but they're really cheap, so don't be afraid to buy them. Before drilling the holes for the M3 standoff, I just placed the PCB in the center and just poked a black marker through the five holes. That provided me with five different locations that I needed to drill the holes. Now once they're fitted, I then just placed the PCB over the standoffs and aligned them with the holes in the PCB. Once fitted and fully secured down, I then attached some M3 nuts, which actually came with the standoffs, and that just helps secure the board into place. A couple of other important parts that we now need to fit are these. One is an SO239 socket, which is where the coax connects from a radio. 
and the other is a single insulated terminal, which is where the wire antenna connects to. Now, as the box is plastic, it isn't too hard to make the holes for these parts. Now, using a tool a bit like this makes it easier to get a perfect round hole and, well, near enough the same size that we need. Now, later, I'll use some silicon sealant just to protect these holes even more. The included power socket for me is not adequate as it's not waterproof. So I got this from Amazon for a fairly cheap price. Now this will provide a nice waterproof connection that we will use to provide 12 volts that's required to power the tuner. Again, just using the same tool as before to make the hole in the plastic, although this hole will be slightly smaller. Now this part, which attaches through the plastic box, does actually have a rubber seal on one side but I'll most likely still add some silicon sealant later. Now I'll just trim the power cable that we soldered on earlier and then solder those wires onto separate pins on the back of that socket. Don't worry, later on I realized that it would be best to use heat shrink and I do change this. So now it's time to move on to the top insulated connector, which is used as a pass through from the RF output on the tuner, well, to the actual antenna wire. Again, we need to make a small hole so this can pass through and be tightened up. There is actually a rubber seal included with this that fits on the top on the outside part of the box. So hopefully this should be enough to stop any water ingress over time. Now, once that's fitted, I'll use a short piece of copper wire to go between the little soldering lug on the insulated pass through bolt and the RF output on that main PCB. Now this is clearly marked on the PCB and I would recommend to keep this wire as short as possible, but once fitted, this is how it looks. Now I need to make a connection between the SO239 socket that we fitted earlier and the PCB. This is so that we can get the RF in straight into the tuner. So I use a short piece of 50 ohm coax and just trim the ends. I solder these and shape them using some pliers so it's easier to solder onto the PCB and the connector. Now that's how it looks when soldered onto the PCB, and this is how it looks when soldered on the inside of that SO239 socket. Lastly, I need to fit this little wing nut, and this will be used as a ground, which when installed outside, I can attach ground radials or even a ground rod. Now I was in two minds here whether to connect this ground lug to either the ground connection point up towards the RF output, or whether I can just use the ground connection near the RF input. Using the ground near the RF input means a shorter cable run if I want to install the ground lug at the bottom of the box, kind of right next to that SO239 socket. Well, as you can see here, I decided to use the ground connection near the RF input, just so the ground cable was shorter. But will this have an impact on performance by not using the ground near the RF output? You can also see from this on screen that I used some heat shrink on those inside power wires on that waterproof socket. Not only does it look better, but it also adds some protection as those wires were extremely close together. Now talking of the power cable, I now need to terminate the power cable on the other side. And this will be the power cable that goes off to a cheap PC power supply to power this when it's installed. Again, I use some heat shrink on those wires just to keep it nice and neat and make sure those wires do not touch each other on the inside of that plug. Now, for those of you shaking your head at me using the edge of a soldering iron to shrink that heat shrink, well, I hope your head falls off. Just to make sure that the tuner is in full automatic mode before screwing down the lid, I connect my radio to the SO239 connection, throw a long length of wire out of the window, and then attach that to the antenna output. Apply some power and then transmit on my radio. Before fitting the lid, I need to install the white colored rubber string. Now this acts as a sealant between the lid and the main box. So make sure you do this if you're going to mount it outside. The screws to secure the lid in place are actually fed from underneath. And as I screw in, you will notice that I did apply some silicon sealant to the screws that go through the base, which secure those brass PCB standoffs. So lastly, I attach the side mounting panels and this makes it easier to mount once we go outside. So outside, and this is my current antenna, it's a 49 to one auto transformer, which is connected to 20 meters of wire in an inverted L configuration. Now I will disconnect the wire from the transformer and then connect it to the output of the ATU350. So here it is installed. Underneath we have the power wire, a ground wire, which goes off to an earth spike, and then the coax, which comes from the radio. 
The power wire just comes into my conservatory and is powered by this cheap CB power supply. The ATU350 does not require much current. I think it's said in the specifications between 300 to 800 milliamps. The ATU350 should now be in automatic mode and to start the tuning, I set the desired frequency on the radio. Change power output between 8 to 12 watts and then change the mode of modulation to something like FM or CW, something that has a continuous output. Now 160 meters wasn't able to be tuned and I was expecting that as the specs do say the lowest frequency supported is 3.5 megahertz. So up on 80 meter band, things are looking good. The SWR dropped pretty much right down to a one to one match. So next I moved up to the 40 meter band at seven megahertz and this is where things started to go wrong. The ATU350 was not able to provide a good enough tune on seven megahertz with the 20 meters length of wire that I was using. Now that was quite disappointing, but let's continue through the bands before we start making any changes to the antenna. The 30 meter band was surprisingly good, although this is a band that I almost never use, so I kind of wasn't really excited about it. 20 meters appeared to start off okay, and on the lower part of the 20 meter band, the ATU 350 didn't even try and tune. But as soon as I moved up the band and tried again, the tuner tried to tune, but it failed. And the next band to try was the 17 meter band at 18 megahertz. And while this is able to tune to a level where the radio is kind of happy, just below three to one, it still is not as good as I would have hoped. In fact, I don't think I would use the antenna with such a close margin to three to one. Now up on the 15 meter band, it managed an SWR of around 1.7. Again, I think it should do better. Now surprisingly, on the 12 meter band at around 24 megahertz, the ATU350 achieved a tune close to one to one. So to me, that's perfectly usable. I then proceeded to perform the same test up on the 10 meter band at around 28.3 megahertz. And while it did settle on a tune offering around 2.8, Again, I feel disappointed that it wasn't any better than this. Now, as this tuner also supports the six meter band at 50 megahertz, I performed the same test and this yielded a result of around two. Not entirely bad, but again, it could be better. Now to try and improve things, I headed back outside and this time I've installed a one-to-one -one line isolator from my other antenna onto the input of the ATU350. Now this is an attempt to reduce any RF flowing down the outside of the coax back to the radio in the shack. Now I've also extended the wire, adding around another seven feet. Now unfortunately, I do not have enough space in my garden to get this out horizontal or vertical. So I kind of went along the fence and then back on itself up the mast. Now I know this is not ideal and probably introducing maybe some kind of linear loading, but it was just a test to see if I could improve things with the SWR on all of the supported bands. So back into the shack to perform the tests again. Now 80 meters was great with a one-to-one -one match. 40 meters was also great this time with a one-to-one -one match. 30 meters was a no-go this time, even though with the previous test, it was good and usable. Now 20 meters yielded an SWR of just below three, so marginally better than before, but still not great. 17 meters managed around three, which is the same reading as we had before with the shorter wire. Now 15 meters was actually worse this time and 12 meters was also worse than before, going from a lovely one-to-one -one SWR to around 2.5 with the longer wire. Now up on 10 meters, testing both 28 and 29 megahertz. Again, the SWR was below three for both, but I felt it should be better. While performing the six meter test again at 50 megahertz, I saw the same result as before with an SWR of around two. But as the 40 meter band was so good this time with the extra length of wire, I proceeded to make a contact. Mike Zero Delta Quebec Whiskey. Mike, Mike Zero Delta Quebec Whiskey. Again, apologies to other stations, I will come, I will work everybody. Yeah, good morning Mark, yeah, you're five and nine, you're five and nine, over. Yeah, name's Matt here, and uh, yeah, you're five nine plus ten, and uh, yeah, just wondering where where are you activating today? Roger, I just confirmed the call. Is it Mike Zero? Uh, I've got Delta Whiskey Whiskey. Just confirm the call, um, please. Uh, yes, yeah, Mike Zero Delta Quebec Whiskey M Zero D Q W. Ah, uh, thanks, Matt. Apologies. Um, I'm down in I'm down near Gravesend. It's probably the easiest way of describing it. Gravesend in Kent. 
Ah, uh, Roger. OK, well, you're sounding great. And, uh, yeah, 10 over the nine here into uh, Buckinghamshire. All right, 73's let you carry on and good luck. Yeah, Roger. I just recognise the voice. Yeah, I, watch, I do watch your YouTube channel, by the way. And, uh, yeah, it was a voice I recognised. And uh, then I just looked at the uh, QRZ uh, lookup. But, yeah, thank you for the channel. Yeah, you're welcome. Very much, uh, very much appreciated you watching. Thanks a lot, 73. 73, Mac. Golf 6, Charlie, Kilo, Kilo, Portable, listening. Now, this is where I stop performing any more tests as I wanted to ask your guys' opinion. If we go back to take a look inside the box, there are a couple of things I'm unsure whether they would affect performance. The first is this part, where the thread of the antenna wire passes through the bolt that's coming into the box by a couple of centimetre. Do you think I should adjust this so it's flush, right up to that white insulator part, or do you think this would not make any difference? The other thing I would like to ask your opinion on is the point in which I've connected the earth lug to. This is where it is currently connected to, just to try and keep that earth wire as short as possible. However, over here on the lower left, near the main RF output, there's also a ground connection. Now you can't see it from this photo, as there's a little light glare overexposing where it's printed GND. But do you think the ground of the antenna should be connected here, instead of the ground on the top right? Now electrically they are connected, but I'm wondering if that ground there is there for a specific reason i.e. to feed off the ground lug on the bottom. Now another thought I had is that I could put some ferrite beads over the incoming power wires. Do you think that would be a requirement too? And if it would help in any way? Something which I didn't really show in the video was a counterpoise. Now I did actually have a 20 meter counterpoise wire connected to that earth lug, as well as a ground spike. The counterpoise was laid around the edge of my garden, but it actually made no noticeable difference. Now let me know what you guys think down in the comments. It's just a shame I do not have a really long garden, otherwise I'll string up a really large length of wire, which is possibly what this tuner needs. Anyway guys, I look forward to reading your comments, and until the next one, thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you in the next video.